Hello, everybody. Happy Thursday. Welcome to our webinar today. Uh, my name is Lee Hurst, and I'm joining you from Training Pros, actually located right outside of Harrisburg, um, which is also where Harrisburg University is. Um, in terms of who Training Pros is, we are, as many of you know, a highly specialized staffing company, and we focus only in the learning and development space. So we're unlike other recruiting companies in that we're highly specialized in helping consultants that specialize in learning and development be placed on high quality and interesting projects through the clients that we work with. Um, some of the other things that make us different, um, people like me who are relationship managers for training pros, come to the table with a background in learning and development. So most of us have been directors of learning or other leadership positions at other companies. And so we're very well versed in the field of learning and development. And we work closely with our clients to help scope out projects and also are very familiar with the skill sets within L&D so we can find the right skill sets for the projects that the clients need. Um, we also work with a very loyal group of um, our talent pool. So we try to build really strong relationships with our consultants, which is one of the things I'm working on right now in Pennsylvania, specifically in the Philadelphia market, is to really get to know the talent that's in our market, make sure we understand the depth of their skills so that when project needs arise, we can do a good job of matching high quality talent on the projects that our clients are looking to staff up. We also have a methodology for getting everybody up to speed, both the consultants and the clients, called Onboarding for Success. And so we work really hard at providing resources to both the client and the consultant to help them prepare for and get ready to start a project and be successful from the first day they're on a client project. Um, you can learn more at our website, um, and certainly you can look me up on uh, LinkedIn. Uh, my name is Lee Hurst, and you'll see on the next slide. Um, as I mentioned, my market area speci especially is in Pennsylvania, so the Harrisburg, Philadelphia market. I also am focused on the New Jersey and New York, mark New York markets as well. Um, my background kind of spans various areas of L&D. I started my career at Accenture in their corporate university function outside of Chicago and then moved into doing business consulting and change management practice. Um, and then I've worked for several startup companies focusing on both public education um, sales training and other types of content areas um, and have most recently run a nonprofit focused on behavior change with relationship to breast cancer in young women over the past 15 years. So I'm excited to be um, on the team with Training Pros. I'm excited to interact with some of you if I haven't met you yet. As I mentioned, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. Happy to be connected. Um, in terms of the type of skill sets that we place for clients, it uh, runs the gamut really across all of the L&D types of skills. You can see here some of our most common skill sets are instructional design and e-learning um, facilitation, but we do have highly specialized talent across all of these areas and can support, support client needs for any of these types of skills. Our partnership with Harrisburg University has been great in terms of being able to provide um, our Learning Views webinar series. So um, Harrisburg University supports us on the academic side of things and from a plat platform perspective to help us bring you to hot topics like the one that we have today um, and allows you to interact with some thought leaders in the industry. And I'm especially excited to introduce today's webinar leader, um, Diane Gajewski, who's the de Dean of the Roy H. Park School of Communications School at Ithaca College. Um, I am an alumni of Ithaca College undergrad and Diane was my professor when I was there. It's been a real pleasure to stay in touch with her over the years and learn about what's going on at the school. And I'm really excited about the topic she's gonna to bring to us today concerning college students and their entry into the workforce. So I'd like to introduce Diane and she's gonna take it over from here. Thank you, thank you so much for joining today. Hi everybody, thank you Lee. Uh, thank you everybody for joining. I uh, note several of my former students and uh, actually the mom of a current student, so go Bombers. Uh, I'm seeing everybody sign in from uh, beautiful locations like Dallas and Atlanta and Florida, and I'm looking out at the gray, cold skies of Ithaca. Uh, so uh, be glad that you didn't have to travel to Ithaca today to, uh, to get together. Uh, anyhow, I'm really excited to have a chance to speak with you. Um, I've spent a lot of time both teaching and doing uh, learning and development and the past 10 years have been a dean uh, immersed in uh, trying to meet the needs of college students today. And when I uh, talk to a number of my colleagues, 
I note that, you know, some of the things that we are experiencing now with the students we have are going to be, or, or very shortly are going to be the uh, participants in your learning uh, programs very soon. So um, I want to share with you just some of uh, my experiences and ideas. We're going to talk a little bit about what's happening and why it's so important to be able to address the needs of this next generation because we're entering a very challenging labor market. A third of them are Gen Z. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about what we are doing in higher ed to accommodate their needs and preferences and, and what they're likely to expect when they go out into other learning spaces. And then I sort of have a little rubric that I call the vowels or the AEIOU model for engaging this generation. So um, if I were able to port you to Ithaca, um, you can meet some of the, the folks that I interact with. And I want to share a little bit of uh, what my life is like and, and who some of my constituencies are. So uh, Lars graduated two years ago. One of our top students, uh, Lars, is actually one of our professionals in residence. And um, when I invited uh, them to come back, I got an interesting email that I have excerpted over on the left. Uh, Lars is medically transitioning. Um, uh, Lars's new name is Larson and prefers to be known by the pronoun they. Um, Lars is uh, currently undergoing gender conforming surgery, so is not able to travel right now. Um, and is, you know, expressing it's been a long and arduous journey and is very excited for it. Um, this is this is one of the things that the that we have been encountering in higher ed is um, the gender fluidity of that is that is quite um, prominently emerging in a Gen Z culture. And we'll talk a little bit later about what that has to do with learning and development. Um, I don't really get a chance to teach much, but I teach a first year intro class. Uh, one of those uh, one credit large lecture things. It's 385 students. It's every first year student in the Park School of Communications. And 58 out of those students had accommodation requests for some sort of learning disability or other disability, mostly learning disabilities or various anxiety disorders. And um, this is not uncommon, especially, I would say, at private and, in, and selective colleges like Ithaca. And some of the accommodations that are frequent are using uh, materials in alternate formats, um, enabling uh, the students to use a laptop or scribe pen at all times, or to assign a particular individual who will take notes for them. A very, very common request is extra time on tests uh, or having testing done in an isolated situation, not, not sitting in a classroom to take a test with others around. Flexible attendance and deadlines. Um, you can imagine what that does in a college classroom. Um, requiring one-on-one -on -one explanation uh, and low distraction environments. So many of our professors are required basically to sort of teach it once and then teach it multiple times one-on-one -on -one with individual students. Uh, taking breaks during tests and classes. Uh, giving trigger warnings for anything that might be disturbing content. Uh, some some um, accommodation requests uh, require that we not require students to make any public presentations in class or in class critique of their work. Um, so we can't ask them to get up as part of a team and talk about their assignment. Or in a screenwriting class, where the common method of teaching is that people go around and workshop their scripts. Um, we 
have to exempt certain students from doing that um, in terms of uh, no critiquing of their, of their work. There are many students who are critical of the system of education as it currently stands. Uh, especially at a place like Ithaca, we've been a predominantly white institution. We're in uh, upstate New York. Uh, the student body has changed quite a bit. We're probably about 20 to 25 percent uh, persons of color. The faculty has not changed as quickly. Uh, and students will write things uh, like this excerpt that was actually published in our student newspaper uh, who say that things like multiple studies show how students who see themselves represented through their teaching staff tend to have better learning experiences. And so we're being very much challenged to diversify the, the faculty and, and the people who are providing the instruction. And students come to us with a really different profile in terms of what they're doing. So Malik is one of my sophomores. He is also an employee of Instagram. He started working for Instagram in his first year. He had a, an interesting Instagram kind of personality. Um, when there was going to be the, the March for Our Lives uh, by high school students that happened um, a year ago, uh, Instagram actually messaged him and said, hi, you know, this is somebody from Instagram, could we talk? He figured one of his friends is pranking him, right? Because like, yeah, sure, Instagram is calling me Malik sitting in the cafeteria in my freshman year, right? So he goes, yeah, sure, call, yeah, yeah, call, expecting that it's, you know, a friend. And in fact, it was Instagram who hired him to cover that march, and that image is him covering that incredible march. So while he is a full-time student, he's also flying around, working for Instagram. He works for JetBlue. But he is quite uh, open about what he experiences emotionally. Um, here he's point. One of his uh, posts recently was, uh, you know, he's pulled all-nighters. He has major anxiety. He is very open about suffering from OCD anxiety. And as he says, I'm stopping myself from crying as I walked around campus. Um, so this is probably not the college student that we knew, maybe not how we experienced college, but it is not uncommon. Certainly not everybody is working for Instagram, but many of them are working and many of them are juggling a lot in their lives because somebody like Malik has the choice of just going out and working for himself and figuring out things on his own. And, um, but it causes tremendous uh, pressure and anxiety. In terms of the counseling staff, uh, and this is nationwide, um, we have more and more of a need for mental health support on campuses. Uh, a couple of years ago, we did a campus climate survey and more than half said that mental health has impacted their learning, working, or living activities at the college. So I'd like to learn a little bit about you and what you've experienced. Um, this is uh, not going to be shared publicly, but in any case, I, I don't need you to share any identifying info, but we're going to put um, uh, a a poll up here, um, uh, a fill-in question, and I'd ask if you can share an example of an accommodation given to somebody that you know in school or college or in the workplace. So it might be um, someone in your family, someone, it might be an accommodation you have provided or that you know someone has, has gotten
Okay, some great answers. Um, we have a couple of people saying that um, an accommodation is to allow employees to work from home. Um, we have an, another college professor in the developmental disability space. Um, the ability to walk out of class. Um, visual schedules. Challenge teaching people who don't know how to use computers. Uh, various kinds of seating, uh, different kinds of testing environments. Um, somebody's mentioning uh, allowing employees to walk away from work or students to walk out of a class if they feel like they're getting stressed. Great answers here. Well, thank you for, sh for sharing all these. Okay, um, Justin, can we go back to the slide? So, um, you know, I'm, I'm glad to uh, engage with you and see that you're familiar with this. Either, you know, you've encountered some of these requests yourself or, or you, you know about people who are getting these. And I put up another poll, and this is asking you if you've adapted any of your training strategies or materials in any of these ways. Uh, here, we're not going to identify you, but we will show the results of the poll. Justin, if you could put up number two. Okay, great, thank you. So it looks like many many of you are already uh, doing a lot of this kind of accommodation. Okay, thanks. We can uh, Justin, we can go on with the slides. So uh, if you have particular examples of things that we we're, we're going to give you a chance to, share some of those later because I'd like to provide sort of a community here where people can uh, make some uh, suggestions or share some case studies. So uh, Lee described a little bit about what I do. I, for the past 10 years, have been dean of the Roy H. Park School of Communications. We're a big comprehensive school of communications, uh, mostly traditionally focusing on uh, entertainment and broadcast media, but we also have a department that teaches instructional technology and employee communication. Um, I also have a, my own consulting company, Gayeski Analytics, and have done a lot of training design and consulting and workshops for professionals in, in corporate communications and learning um, really across the world. I got into this um, when I started investigating interactive media back in the very early days, around 1980, and uh, the world sort of beat a path to my door, uh, which was at the end of a, a dirt driveway, <laughs> a dirt road, uh, in, outside of Ithaca. And I've had a, a great ride for the last uh, several decades working uh, in this space. Uh, and now a lot of my work as a dean is working with faculty on curriculum, also developing admission strategies and retention strategies um, to try to figure out um, how Gen Z thinks about things, how they best learn, um, what they see for themselves in the future, and especially uh, understanding the role of their parents in all of this. Uh, for all of us in the human resources and the learning and development field, um, there's, gonna, there's a big shift that's occurring, and I don't know if you're seeing it in your own organizations, but there really is a labor crisis that is hitting. Uh, there, it's nice for our economy that there is a low unemployment rate, uh, but what we're seeing is um, a pretty rapid retirement of baby boomers. There, 
has a there is a smaller population of people who are in middle age. Um, education attainment is plateauing actually, and what we are seeing is that a lot of high school students now, more so than ever, are seriously considering not going to college or any sort of post secondary education. Uh, when still uh, most of our jobs require that. Uh, there is a labor shortage that's going on, and more people uh, who can work are quitting jobs. Um, so because of this, we can't afford not to be inclusive. Uh, first of all, it's the right thing to do to be able to offer the right kinds of learning opportunities that are uh, equal and inclusive for all members of our society who can participate. But from a business perspective, we can't afford not to be inclusive. Uh, as a college, we can't say, um, if you have trouble meeting deadlines, we don't want you in our journalism department. We can't afford to say that. We have to work very carefully around that to be able to be realistic uh, with students to prepare them uh, for what the careers are going to be. But they also expect that careers are going to shift to accommodate their needs. And so the conditions of learning and the conditions that we are preparing for uh, really have to be modified, uh, or we are just not going to have enough people to do the work. Uh, so just you know, quickly, a couple of graphs, if you can just um, kind of see what has been going on. There is this, you know, uh, right after the the stock market collapse around 2008. Right after that, there, there were a great many people looking for work and not many jobs available. And look at the end over to the right where we are today. It's just the opposite. Those lines have crossed. And a lot of people who are not working don't want to work. They've, they've either given up they're making uh, money some other way, but they have no intention of even going into the workplace. So we cannot afford to exclude those who we traditionally have excluded. So a little bit of a profile of who Gen, Gen Z is. Uh, these are the people basically right before college age and right after college age. About half of them are non-white. About half of them report that they suffer from mental health issues. Uh, about uh, a little less than a quarter have some kind of identified disability. Um, even before they get to college, about 14% in public schools uh, are receiving special ed services. About 11% of college students have learning disabilities. I would say at a place like Ithaca that's a private institution where we have smaller classes, that percentage is much higher. Uh, in particular, the rate of autism is increasing. Uh, the number of students who don't identify as cisgender or who identify as gender fluid is greatly increasing. Uh, even things that we expect about having a religion at all, not necessarily, and even their food preferences are quite different. Um, and so when we talk about designing learning spaces, it's not just about the content or whether we offer it in various media formats so that it's accessible to people who have, let's say, visual disabilities. Or it's not just providing more time on tests. It is the way that we depict people. It's the people who present the training and who are presented as authorities. And it's everything that goes around learning and development, even in being able to respect various kinds of religious or non-religious observations, and even in providing food. And it's, it's, a, it's a big picture. We're not doing a good job right now in employing people who are disabled. Um, they, people who have a disability, who have a bachelor's degree, do a little bit better. But if they don't make it into college, uh, 
and even if they do make it into college, the unemployment levels of people with disabilities are unacceptably high. Uh, and in terms of mental health, that is the biggest thing that we see as a challenge uh, among our students. Um, I told you a little bit about that first year student group that I teach. So wait, we had um, a little under 400 first year students in the Park School of Communications. The, that one credit class that I teach is pass fail. Honestly, it is very easy to pass. It's almost difficult to fail the class. You show up, there are a couple of assignments where the rubrics are extremely clear, like developing a possible four-year plan of what you want to take and when you might want to study abroad. Another one is a 20-question uh, multiple choice test. They have six weeks to read the material. They have 50 times, yes, five zero times, that they can take the multiple choice test, and it tells them the right answer after each question. And they need to get 18 out of 20 to pass. So that's the kind of thing. I mean, it's meant to be. It's meant to step them through things that we need them to do and to have them pass. And about 30 students failed. So it's not because they couldn't grasp the material. Uh, for many of them, they could not crawl out of bed. They have such overwhelming anxiety, or they would miss one class, and they'd be afraid to go to the next one. So these are real issues that are impairing their ability to function well. And we hope that they get through college. And we're trying to do a better job to make sure that they do. Uh, but we do wonder what's going to happen once they're out of our hands and into yours. Um, the, the gender fluidity and the the acceptable language around gender is something that is extremely important to young people. And it's given us a difficult time in um, even using the word they, which is what many students prefer. Most of us have learned that they is the plural. Uh, that's not necessarily true. And it's very easy to make a mistake. Uh, and when we make mistakes, we are really excluding them, and we really get called on it as we should. But that is their expectation. Um, so even simple things like restroom facilities or uh, the representation that we use in, um, in our various examples has got to reflect who they are, who, who the, this group is. They are extremely diverse. So what kind of drives them? I think there are a lot of stereotypes that most of us uh, immediately assume. It is true that this, this is the group that has had mobile technologies since birth. It is not the internet. It's not online. Um, this has not been the the computer and the internet has not been the source of the biggest change. It is, according to many researchers, the fact that these are mobile technologies and they are, in fact, in their hands all the time. They also, because of this, is, um, tend to have very high and unrealistic expectations. It's the Instagram um, world. Uh, many teenagers are obsessed with Instagram and how they look and how they document themselves and how many likes they get and who is following them. Uh, and there's been a big difference. I have seniors in college talking about their younger siblings, maybe three or four years younger, and they say they don't understand them because they are so tied to documenting everything on Instagram and it has to look perfect. And because everything looks perfect, they're really unrealistic expectations of what life is like. They tend to have been very isolated in their own generation. They're very programmed. Um, after school, they don't just come home and hang out. They're in various activities that are very structured for them. And it's pretty much with kids of their own age. They, um, 
do not regularly interact with adults other than their parents and those in supervisory situations. They have unfortunately been experiencing a world in which school and community violence is around them. They are engaging in drills all the time, active shooter drills. They very much almost despair about what they see happening to the world. So I think that's where a lot of the depression comes from. And they feel that some of these issues are so much more important than anything else that we can be talking about. And they still maintain very strong ties to parents. And some of you may see that, especially if you are training entry-level workers. Um, we actually had a presentation by some consultants uh, on Tuesday who came in to look at the way we do open houses here at the college. And they said, you know, it's, it's more than ever a joint purchasing decision. And it used to be that the college students w couldn't wait to get away from their parents and they understood the parents were paying the bill, but they very much didn't like that whole situation. And the more that they could be independent, the better. And now it is quite different. Uh, generally, they want their parents very involved. And what I see happening is students calling their moms and dads or texting them multiple times during the day, all through their college years. Um, so actually, a number of organizations, I mean, it used to be bring your kid to work, and now it's bring your parent to work days. And a lot of that, and this gets into motivation and understanding where their heads are and who their influencers are, they are more tied to their parents because they are co-debtors uh, in many cases for many tens of thousands of dollars. And many young people have more than one job because they are paying off enormous student lo loans. So I think as we try to understand what motivates people, what motivates them to want to learn or persist in their jobs, or what are some of the background stressors that may be leading them to not perform well or not engage in learning very well, um, I would say one of the biggest things that is different for them is starting out with such an enormous debt and not only emotional, but financial ties to parents. And that makes uh, a lot of decisions for them. Um, so some of the things that, I, that are myths, we want to look at the left. Um, I think we, we, we assume that they mostly want to communicate through technology because they do that all the time. I don't think that is the case. They want both. But when we ask students, and ours are traditional college age, I'm not talking about older ad adult learners, people returning to work, um, but they don't want to learn through technology. They don't want to communicate. They really are looking for person-to-person -person influence. I had always assumed that they're great at email, websites, um, office applications. So for many years, I mean, I, I remember back in the early days when we had to teach PowerPoint and Microsoft Word. We had to teach people how to use a mouse and all that. And then for a number of decades, we eliminated all that stuff in our curriculum. I mean, they, they came to us and they were absolute wizards at all these packages. Not so much now. Uh, this group of first-year students does not know how to use email. They didn't know how to use very simple web interfaces because they are almost entirely experiencing things on a mobile device. Um, one of the biggest challenges I had was getting students to write a very short paper using Microsoft Word because they had never seen it. it. It reminded me of 1982. Um, and I think we think they want to just find and process information online. They can do it easily, but that's not really what their preferences are. Uh, and what we have found is they actually like face-to-face -face learning environments. Uh, more than ever, they want to identify with an instructor or mentor. 
And that's where we're seeing a lot of this. Um, we want to see ourselves represented by our instructor. I didn't see that very much in previous generations. You know, a woman and you had a, a male professor, I mean, that was okay. You know, it was nice to have a woman if you were a woman, but it was like no big deal. Um, but overall, people really want to see somebody that they feel is a role model. And it very much, what I hear is, looks like me. Um, what I'm seeing is that coming out of high school, there's lots of feedback and reminders. And telling them something once doesn't really click in. And I don't know if they've gotten mixed messages, but for us, just saying something or putting it on the syllabus, uh, they almost don't believe it until they hear it many times. They like to use online for quick checks and social banter uh, and not email. Uh, but they may feel more comfortable sharing very private information in an online forum first. So if you're trying to break through and, you know, people are, are experiencing anxiety or something like that, they might feel more comfortable in texting that to you first. But overall, they really, really do uh, cry out for mentors and people who are like them. So it's something that we struggle with a lot more, and just in terms of having multiple examples. Um, in a lot of my classes, we Skype in or Zoom in uh, alumni, and I get a lot of feedback from students when they don't see themselves represented. So I've, I've personally had a struggle in being able to, try, I have to try to bring in six different people rather than one person because it really makes a difference who they are um, to these learners. So what really motivates them uh, in terms of how to get them engaged and even wanting to be a better, better performer and better learner um, is really trying to connect their experience to the purpose and the values of the organization. Um, Motivating them by saying, if you learn something, you'll sell more, you'll make more, you'll get a promotion. Not so much. Um, they really want to identify with an organization's value and purpose and the leadership. Um, a lot of organizations are using various kinds of social rewards that people can give to one another. The, the picture that I have illustrated there um, is, uh, is an app called Bonusly. And you can give other people in your organization points that then result in rewards. So it's like giving somebody else a pat on the back. So they, they really like frequent feedback, a lot of feedback on how the work is to make sure that it's meaningful to them. Uh, and so I kind of broke it down into maybe some takeaways for you. And I, I kind of do it as the AEIOUs. And the A is in authenticity. Um, this is a group that has a high BS filter. Um, they want to know who the organization's leadership is, the values. They want to know the authentic challenges that are going on. They like problem-based learning. Um, they really want to be able to see the, the organization for all of its challenges and its opportunities and its weaknesses and then be able to authentically engage in something that they think is going to make a difference. Uh, e is the engagement. They want to bring their whole selves. So um, by that you have to engage not only what they're doing at work but, but what else is their passion. Uh, many of them are very passionate about other kinds of causes and their goals may be much different than just their work. And, and they all have a tribe or a group of people who share those goals and passions. And they want, to, they want that involved as well. Inclusion, very, very important. And we've, I'm sure that all of you who are here have made great strides in terms of diversity and representation, both in terms of ethnic diversity and gender diversity. 
but but even more than ever, um, things about religion, uh, sexual identity, all kinds of manifestations of identity really are, as I said, extremely important to them. Opportunities. Um, what I hear from students who are graduating, the best ones really want to go to a place that will provide training and mentoring for them. So this is a good thing for those of us in training and development. Um, but the, if you can provide them with stretch goals, opportunities for mentoring, opportunities for more training that they can get involved in, they will probably be more persistent in staying at the organization. And, and finally, universal design. Make sure that anything that we provide to them is accessible in, in every way, both in websites, uh, you know, capture, uh, captioning videos, uh, make sure that any exercises that we have in classes, I mean, we even see simple things that we might have been doing like little icebreakers may not be accessible to everyone if they have physical limitations. So, you know, think back about everything that we have done and said and try to remember is, is everybody really represented here and can they all engage in whatever that activity or learning is? Um, before I end, I'm going to ask uh, Justin to put up uh, one more opportunity for you to give some input. And I, I'd love for you to share an, ex uh, an example of a challenge that you may have had in making uh, training inclusive or specifically uh, training for the Gen Z audience. So if you uh, want to take a couple minutes and, and shoot something to me, um, we have a couple more minutes where we can share some examples and resources. Someone just shared that they've had to revise some of the um, characters they've used in a simulation because there was not enough body diversity. That, that's, uh, that's really important, body diversity. I, I hear that a lot. Well, I hear students talking a lot about body shaming, and they're very sensitive to that. They're very sensitive about not just showing people who have, who represent traditional models of beauty or attractiveness. Body diversity in every way. Uh, and the gender thing is a, is a real important part. We've been criticized for sh only showing people who look traditionally male or female. So some other folks have uh, done, uh, used text message, uh, added social media to part of a class. Yeah, somebody else said the biggest thing is getting gender fluid representation. Yeah. And we are also trying to get depictions. I'm, I'm in the midst of doing a lot of web redevelopment. We also do have students who have physical disabilities. Some people use wheelchairs. Uh, and, and we want to include that, but we also want to do it in a sensitive way. Um, we don't want to walk into a class and say, hey, can we take a picture of you because you have a wheelchair? Um, very, very sensitive things to do. So yeah, thank you. I, I, we have a lot of really good um, ideas and challenges here. Um, I would hope that there might be some other, some more ways that um, this group, if people are interested, might be able to stay in touch and, and share some examples. Um, on the last slide that I've posted, Justin, if you want to go back to that, I, my email is there. I've also listed um, just a couple of other resources. If you're interested in universal design and uh, learning, uh, EduCause is a very, uh, a very good resource. Uh, the Chronicle of Higher Ed has a good, uh, good article on the case for inclusive learning. Um, 
if you look at almost any university, there are very good resources for students with learning disabilities and, and for professors in learning how to accommodate that. Um, another really good uh, resource right across the road from me in Ithaca is Cornell University. They have one of the largest institutes for um, disability and employment. It's called the Yang Tan Institute um, for Employment and Disability. And they have a lot of resources in general about employment, about accommodations, about learning and hiring people with disabilities. Um, and um, as I say, many, many university websites uh, are developing uh, more resources. So a local university uh, office of whatever they may call it, it might be their educational technology office, but they will also have an office for students with disability or accessibility office. Um, they'd be good folks to, to, uh, to be in touch with. So uh, we're getting near the end here because I know we want to um, provide some time for some debrief at the end. Um, and uh, if you want to have any other ideas or uh, shoot me some uh, comments or things that we could share, I would be glad to, to do that. You can use the chat box if there's uh, anything else you'd like to share. And I'm going to be conducting some more research uh, in all this. If you have some uh, ideas that you would uh, like to point me to, I'd be happy. I have um, one question here. You find that other faculty members are accepting of these differences and willing to adapt. Boy, that's a really good question. Honestly, this is something we struggle with because what we run into is Sometimes we are very accommodating in our courses, and then our students go out into internships and are not successful because the workplace is not as accommodating. And we really struggle, because we are a professional school, about how far to go with accommodations. So for example, we do have students in journalism who will say, you, I, I, have a, um, I have a learning disability, I cannot write on a deadline. I need flexible attendance, and I do not want to be exposed to images or situations that may cause anxiety, may trigger anxiety. And we kind of step back and go, uh, that is the definition of journalism, that you are put into situations which are anxiety producing, and you produce things on a deadline. And we need to rethink all that. And I don't know what the right answer is. I think part of it is being able to counsel students into a career that fits their strengths. But also, probably, the workplace has to change. And certainly, there are going to be um, careers. And we tell students, you know, David Muir, who's the anchor of ABC World News Tonight, is one of my grads. David can't say, you know what, guys? Um, I don't feel like going on the air at 6.30 tonight. I'm feeling anxious. Could we make it 7? Uh, no, he's going to go on the air at 6.30, whether he's been dro literally dropped into a war zone. Um, that job is probably not going to change. Will other jobs change? Yeah, they are. So I'm not sure exactly. I think, I think that all of us in learning want people to be successful, but then... It's also difficult to know when to tell people we can't accommodate this and you really need to rethink the area that you're going into. Now, Brad here is asking, you know, you have uh, client demands about timelines and how do you accommodate Gen Z? That's, um, that's the big question. Um, 
I'm thinking that we have to find ways to scaffold them uh, because I think it's also not helpful developmentally to say to someone, you have a real fright of speaking in public and therefore we're never going to give you any opportunities in the rest of your life. You're just not going to do that. I think for lots of us, that would have been pretty limiting. A lot of us have stage fright or were really, really worried. I mean, I remember the first speech class I took in high school. I was shaking, uh, but I had to do it anyhow. And I think that there may be ways of providing scaffolding to say, you may not be ready now, and I don't want to provo provoke an anxiety attack, but can we scaffold you so that maybe you can get comfortable doing this? And, and I think the same thing with time management. Um, maybe there are ways of providing more flexibility so that they can still meet the time, the deadlines, but maybe in a more flexible way. I think um, I think having them as part of the design team is really interesting. Some of our uh, I, there is someone who said uh, useful if Gen Z are inclusive in designing curricula. Now, one of the things we had a we had a meeting of our diversity advocates group in our school, which is students, faculty, and staff inter interested in DNI. And one of our professors said, "I would really like to be able to show some of my uh, my my learning designs and my teaching examples to some students before I do it." Is I think we have a lot of professors who are very afraid of engaging in sensitive discussions and getting it wrong. We have had examples on our campus where people try to engage in discussions uh, that are sensitive, a lot about racial issues, but other economic and political issues. And if they don't manage it well, it really blows up. And we've had a lot of our professors say to some of our students, could I show you what I'm planning? And their students are not in their class necessarily. Uh, but, you know, other students, can, can I show you some of the things that I'm thinking about and tell me, should I do this, not do it? Um, how, how would we, how could we manage it? I think maybe getting input would be helpful. But I think we are running out of time now. I really want to thank everybody for, uh, for jumping on. I hope I get a chance to talk to many of you in person in some way. And thank you, Lee, for inviting me to this. All right, we'll uh, we'll take it out of here, Diane. Thank you, thank you very much, and also thank you, thank you, Lee. Um, you know, I know this this presentation and the ideas that that Diane discussed certainly resonate here with our student population at HU. So I, I definitely learned a lot myself. Um, I want to thank Training Pros for allowing us to bring uh, you know engaging and you know hot topics like this uh, to the webinar. Um, if you so, if you can, if you don't mind staying on uh, for a few minutes, I'm going to. Uh, give us an opportunity to give some feedback, uh, feedback on the technical production of the webinar. Uh, we take the feedback very seriously. We want to keep improving these and also give you an opportunity to give us any ideas for future webinars. Uh, we also look look to those to, to kind of fuel the future of this. So um, thank you very much, everybody, for attending. Enjoy the rest of your Thursday, and we will look for you at the next webinar. Have a good day.